Hello, welcome to Gems of the 99 Cent Bin. This is the first episode in this series, so I hope you enjoy it and come back for more. Today I'm going to show you a very underappreciated game, Finny the Fish and the Seven Waters. Now before we get into the game itself, an important part of the story is explaining how I discovered this gem. See, every now and then, the official PlayStation Magazine disc would include a demo for a Japanese game. Sadly, this bonus feature did not run often enough. But in issue 84, the disc included a demo for a Japanese game called Yuo. You play the role of a fish, and it's a very enjoyable demo. Except it begins with a 15 minute tutorial, which has 11 minutes and 53 seconds of untranslated, unskippable cutscenes. Even the magazine mentions how long the cutscenes are. How are we even supposed to know what's going on if it's untranslated? But regardless of the patience required, the demo is very good. After experiencing everything the demo had to offer, I put it away and forgot about it. I didn't expect to see this game on store shelves. After all, why should I expect that? The magazine points out that it's a Japanese import available in the United States only on the OPM demo disc. I thought the whole purpose of including it as a weird import on this disc was to give us a taste of a game that's never going to make it outside of Japan. But then a few years later, as I browsed through a used video game store, I came across Finny the Fish and the Seven Waters. I was stunned. I couldn't believe UO actually got a Western release. I was very into the PS2 scene at this time, but I had never heard anything about this game aside from the UO demo. Even the clerks behind the counter didn't know anything about it. This game slipped completely under the radar. It had little or no marketing whatsoever. That surprises me, because this game is the first collaboration between Sony and Sega that I'm aware of, and I can't help but think that this game's well-crafted environments are a result of having what is essentially two first-party developers working on the same game, one of them of course having left the hardware side just a few years earlier. But the publisher that brought it over to North America was Natsume. Somehow that doesn't surprise me. Let me explain this. I have strong evidence that Natsume is the first video game developer to have a fish fetish. Just about every fishing game out there seems to be developed by them. Everything from real fishing to River King is made by Natsume. But if all of their fishing games were to be grouped together, by far the most fascinating one has to be Finny the Fish. This game includes fishing, but this time you play as the fish. It's like, imagine if they made a SimCity game where he plays Rob Ford. Fortunately, the role reversal in Finny the Fish is a lot better, and it turns into a well thought out adventure game. Along with a much welcome skip button for the cutscenes, it was nice to finally figure out what the heck those Japanese characters were actually saying. Finny is the chosen one, a reluctant hero who needs to save his underwater world by collecting seven statues and fighting an unknown evil. To get the statues, you need to go through seven areas and fetch objects or solve puzzles for characters you encounter. The game plays up Finny's reluctant hero role perfectly as he begrudgingly agrees to go on tedious quests like this one. Right here in my room, I don't have enough water. The waterfall over there stopped for some strange reason. Can you go to the waterfall and fix the problem for me? Once you do it, come back and see me. I'll give you my statue then. Surprises. You'll get my statue then. Thank you. In true Japanese fashion, you'll find characters that do stuff like this to find hidden objects for you, and a seagull who knows kung fu. The 
The puzzles are simple, but interesting enough to keep your attention. This is an adventure game at its purest. If you're ever stuck, just look at the map and explore an area that you haven't seen yet, and the solution will probably pass right in front of you. The source material gives the game some unique mechanics. As a fish, Finny needs to eat, and the levels have a wide variety of prey. While Finny is a generic anthropomorphic fish, probably some sort of bass I assume, the prey are all modeled after real fish. This part almost makes it feel like an educational game, but you'll have to watch out because sometimes when you're hunting for a tasty meal, you'll find out you've been fooled by a fisherman who had the same idea. If you get caught, you take a penalty and the game continues. But if you could break the fishing line, you get to keep the lure and add it to your collection. The game keeps track of everything you catch, which is fun if you like to collect, but thankfully it's not required to make progress in this game. The prey mechanic is novel, but it does lead to a few annoyances. What you eat doesn't automatically refill your life meter. Instead, you have to stay still so magic can happen. But beware, because you can easily empty your stomach, and if you do that, you take damage until you eat again. That defeats the whole purpose of regaining your health in the first place. Another flaw that many reviewers at the time scorned the game for was the camera control and the control of Finney himself. But I actually didn't experience any issues with the camera, and the lock-on feature took care of any issues with finding or hunting anything. I'll admit that Finney's controls are a little awkward at first, especially when it comes to landing jumps. It almost feels like you're controlling, well, a fish. So if you're expecting flawless 360 degree movement, you're probably not going to find it here. But none of these limitations ever got in my way of enjoying or finishing the game. One of the control issues that did affect me though, was the swimming. If you hold down the X button you'll swim, and if you tap it you'll swim faster. Because I like to get from point A to point B very quickly, a controller with a turbo button was a necessity. Now while you're meeting new characters in the game, they keep harping about some unnamed evil that's sweeping the seas, and during the course of the game you see plenty of evidence of human activity. It's unavoidable. So naturally I thought, okay game, lay it on me. I know we're going to find out that the evil monster is man himself. But actually, it's not. I won't spoil the ending for you, but I will tell you it made absolutely no sense to a westerner like myself. But you do defeat a final boss, so at least there's a proper video game payoff. I find this game to be very unique. It really explores the possibilities available in a game that takes place in an underwater world. Really, the closest thing to it would be Echo the Dolphin. So why wasn't it more popular? I guess it didn't help that the cover looks like something Fisher-Price made. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of information out there about this game, not even a Wikipedia page. We already talked about how this game received almost no marketing, so why was that? This was a game developed by both Sony and Sega, which are both huge development houses, but it took a third party, Natsume, to release it outside of Japan. Maybe Natsume just didn't have the resources to properly market this game. Maybe after the game received mixed reviews, they just lost interest in the project. But it almost feels like Sony and Sega made a great game, and once it was ready for release, they wanted nothing more to do with it. Is it possible that there were still some lingering hard feelings from the Dreamcast vs. PS2 era? Again, there's not a lot of info out there. I'm just speculating, and we might never know the actual reason why. The end credits play over photos showing how you've restored the seas to their natural balance, and everyone's getting along. But it seems Fane's troubles didn't end with poor marketing. He's also not the smartest fish in the pond. He fell for the oldest trick in the book. Finney should never accept a ride from a seagull. Well, there goes any hope for a sequel. I also wanted to mention that I was able to find this recently. It took a long search to find it, and I didn't think I'd be able to locate one before making this video. It's a Finney the Fish plushie, and from what I've been told, I think it was a pre-order bonus. I have a feeling that these will be pretty rare in the future, because not only is Finney an obscure game, but how the hell did they expect us to pre-order it if it had no marketing campaign? Again, it was tough to find one, but for whatever reason they seem to be more popular in Europe. When I discovered this game, it was priced at $3, which made it the cheapest game in that store. Now before anyone hits the comments and says, that means it isn't a 99 cent gem, well, I did find it later on for 99 cents. And it's when I found this gem for 99 cents that I was inspired to create the series you're enjoying right now. Now let's look at the flip side of the coin as I call it. Not all games can be called 99 cent gems, so this is the part of the show where I look at a game that didn't earn that title for whatever reason. Today we're going to look at Space Chase, a game developed by Apollo in 1981 for the Atari 2600. 
Space Chase is a run-of-the-mill space shooter from the Atari era. The gameplay copies Space Invaders, except there are fewer enemies on screen and they move a lot faster and independently of one another. The game has a moving background, but it's not interactive at all, it's just there for show. And that's pretty much it. There's not a lot to say about the gameplay here. It's the kind of game that I call Atari Simple. The gameplay couldn't get much more simplified if they tried. All you do is shoot down one enemy wave after another until you run out of lives. Every now and then, an enemy will fire a shot that homes in on you, and it's very difficult to avoid it, because your ship moves so slowly. That's really the only thing that adds difficulty to this game. If your ship moved faster, there really wouldn't be any challenge at all. The gameplay gets boring very quickly, and because it's such a weak entry into the space shooter genre, all you could think about is what you would rather be playing instead of this game. You know a game is really boring, when the most exciting thing that happens is a glitch. My ship got hit while I destroyed an enemy on my last life, and when it got back to the screen the enemy was a solid blob. Weird. Also did you notice those seven lines on the left hand side? At first I thought the cartridge or the console itself wasn't working properly, but when I looked at other screenshots online, I noticed that all of them had the same lines as well. I could see now that they correlate with the rows that enemy ships appear on, so I guess it was there during development and they just shipped the game without bothering to remove it. I genuinely don't want to know how much people paid for this game when it was new. I feel ripped off for paying just 99 cents for it. I would rather eat 99 cents. I'm not hating on the old Atari. It actually has some pretty amazing games on it, and you'll probably see some of those featured later on in the series. But that's all the time we have for today. I plan to post a new Gems of the 99 Cent Bin episode every other Thursday, so if you like this, go ahead and subscribe. We're also going to have special episodes and hardware reviews in between, so take care and I'll see you guys next time.